Yes. <laughs> So, the theorem says simply the following. Um, let the origin, which I will just call x vector equal to 0. So, I wanted to make this point. If you find some equilibrium point that's not at the origin, you can also always make a coordinate transformation to translate that to the origin. So it's useful when doing global stability, as you will see, to always translate your point to the origin by some convenient point of translation. Uh, no, I'll show you what I mean. But just know, just consider this point to be the origin. So that the origin x equals to zero be in some domain called that D, which is a subset of origin. So some origin point is in this domain D, which is a subset of origin. And let this be in equilibrium point of your dynamical system. Okay. Then let this scalar function Z, which goes from D to R, be a continuous and differentiable function such that the following three properties are true. Number one, that z of zero is equal to zero. That z of x is greater than zero for all x in this domain excluded from the origin. So at every point except zero, the function is positive. And further, the time derivative dz by dt is less than zero um, for all x d excluded. If the following is true, then we say that x is equal to zero is asymptotically. So, in other words, and a function that satisfies one to three is what we call a real function. So that is a more practical way of determining whether something is globally or asymptotically. Now, it could be point three is usually where people get caught up of showing that the derivative is strictly negative. So if you are not able to show this, and instead all you can show, the best you can do, is dz by dz is less than or equal to zero, so a slightly weaker condition, then we just say the point x equal to zero is simply just a state. Not as important. So I just wanted to make mention that extremely important theorem because the Lasalle's invariance principle can be sometimes difficult to apply. Okay. So let us now see how this stuff works. So I, my challenge was to find examples that were not just examples for the sake of being examples, but maybe go into different fields like economics, chemistry, biology, so forth. So that's my plan, that is to start in different different subject areas and show you really that it's all different. I can't do too much physics, obviously, because I don't want to scare half the class, um, which I did on the first day with the simple ball falling from the sky. So I will start with some examples actually from economics and game theory. So I promised you that on the first slide. So, and there's some, a lot of economic students in here for some reason. So that's a good thing. Uh, okay. So let's let's do some examples. So in particular, we'll look at game theory. And in particular the subset of what is called evolutionary dynamics. Okay, what is this? So consider 
this is not an economics course, obviously, which is probably a good thing. Um, so I will skip over some of the economics theory, also because I'm not an economist. I don't know if you've noticed this. Okay. So consider a population in which individuals, which are called in this context replicators, exist in several different types. Each type of individual uses a pre-programmed or predetermined strategy. letters and numbers behind what I just wrote. So, individuals are programmed are to use or choose what we call in game theory pure strategy from a finite set. And we denote this set, just call it S. And within this set, we have a set of strategies. So call them S1 all the way to S. So this is capital S. And those are small. Okay. Now here's where the different equations come in. It's just the sum over all small n. Okay. So I just want to pay, let's say, n. Okay. And furthermore, the proportion of individuals in the individuals using strategy as i we will denote by xi as equal to ni over x. And that's the matrix. So you can see xi is always going to be a percentage, like between 2 and 1. Okay. Now, the dynamical systems part come, comes into play, I suppose. 
we are interested in predicting how the proportion of these populations will evolve over time, given that strategy set. So given our strategy set is so forth, how will the individual proportions of these populations evolve over time? So if one third of the population chooses to use strategy S1, and one third uses S2, and one third uses S3, at a certain time later, what will that population distribution be? Yes? This finite strategy set. But then, as a point of time, the first one has to descend, and this is the last strategy of the first one to use. That's what we have to figure out. So, this is where the interesting part comes in. That is the, that is the question, right? How do they pass it on to the descendants? How, did, how is that evolving? So, let's see. So, Using, I'll just say, economics theory, because I don't want to get into now actuarial stuff. It's very boring. For us. Anyway, uh, you can show that dxi by dt is equal to the following equation. I'll explain these terms in a second. So pi <coughs> si of x minus pi bar x times x pi. What in the world is all this mean? This function here, pi si of x, is called the payoff function. Payoff to, for using strategy si, and pi bar is the average And we define the average payoff as follows. It's just an average. So it's going to be sum i equals 1 to n, xi pi si. And furthermore, we have a constraint to this equation, naming that the population at any given time has to end up to 1, right? That's because it's a person. So we have a constraint. changes depending on the payoff. And by payoff, I mean the benefit you get by using a certain strategy versus another one. So it's dependent on. So how do you get these payoff functions? That is the whole So let's do an example. So the standard example in game theory is what we call the prisoner's dilemma. Now let me show you. One. So example. Simplify to just a case of two people. 
So you and your friends are criminals. Um, sorry, I, there's no other way to present this example. Um, and the idea is that you both get caught for a crime. But the police actually doesn't have any hard evidence against you. So you make a deal with your friend before you go into the interrogation room uh, that no matter what, we are not going to squeal on each other. We are going to just avoid it. So then the police say, if you both stay silent, you just get one year in jail. But then the police throw a twist on you. They separate you into two rooms. And they say, if you rat out your friend, you can walk away spot free and heal it up on jail. So the idea is, what do you do in that situation? And we can now have to use game theory to figure out what is the optimal strategy for each person. What will they do? And if the choice they make, is it the optimal choice? Is it the rational choice? Is it the irrational choice? So let's see what happens. So the way you formalize what I just said is you set up what is called a payoff matrix. I, I think so, yes. <laughs> and you have two strategies in your strategy set. So in S, we will be known by one strategy I will call it C, and another strategy I will call it T. And the reason is the following. C we call the cooperate strategy, and D means to defect. So will you defect or will you cooperate with this? In other words, defect, I just mean betray your friend. <laughs> I told you, you had to be patient with the theory stuff I was doing, because now we can have fun for two weeks or so. <laughs> and cooperate means to just, um, with the authority. So let's some numbers to um, In the Nash's original 1950s paper, he used this terminology, so I'm just thinking to all of you. I know it's not, I was confused by it when I first looked it too, but Nash is not in Jesus for some reason. Did you need So what you do is you literally set up a matrix, like a table of possible options. So on one hand, you put CD, and on another hand, you put CD, like this. So the idea is that you fill in these uh, rows and columns based on numbers you assign to picking the strategy. So I'm going to arbitrarily just put numbers here that make sense. But there's more general ways to do it that we'll see later. So for this specific example, I would just put in numbers. And the payoff matrix here is given in terms of years of jail, or years of prison. So if both friends cooperate with each other, let's give friend one three and three, let's say. So the idea is that the number you put corresponds to the payoff for the first individual. That's how it's done in game. So this means that if both friends cooperate with each other and don't run, they both will get three years in prison. But three refers to the focal individual, the one individual you're talking about. That's how you read these. If one cooperates and one defects, we'll give zero. If one defects and the other cooperates, we'll get five years of jail. And one year of jail if they both defect. So based on this now, we should be able to write down a dynamical system that describes the evolution of these strategies. So let's see. So the first step, I'm giving everything in terms of x1, x2 here, xi. So let me use that term. So let x1 be the proportion of individuals that use strategy C. Similarly, 
let x2 be the proportion of individuals that use strategy So then, our replicated dynamics equation look like this form. Then, so I'm just rewriting what I wrote on this book. But I'm just applying this one. So instead of dx by dt, remember I said I'm using the prime equation. So x1 prime is equal to pi of s1 x minus pi of x times x1. Now, S1 is my first strategy, which is just C in this case. So this is just pi of C of x minus the average payoff, x1. Now, <coughs> what is the average payoff function? Let's compute that first. So pi bar of x is equal to, remember, just by applying the formula, so x1 times pi c of x plus x2 times pi of x. So that's the average curve. Okay. It's just by applying the equations from here. Okay. Now the question is, what are the individuals, what is pi of c of x, what is pi of c of x? We read that directly off from the table. Okay. So, pi of c of x you literally just go across the rows here. So, x1 refers to the rows here. That's how you refer to the equation. You refer to the numbers in the rows. So this would be 3x1 plus 0x2 for the pi of c of x. So pi of c of x, which is the first strategy in row 1, you simply write as 3x1 plus 0 times x2, just by reading off the rows. So this is just the Similarly, pi of d of x, you just go in the second row. So it's 5x1 plus 1x2. Is that okay? So I will always give you the tables, right? And ideally, as you will see, our answer depends heavily on the numbers I put here as you can imagine. But the more general way to do this is to put any letter here. And then see how the numbers really affect your strategy. But just for an example's sake, an initial example, I'm making it a little easier. But it's okay up to here how I got pi of c of x and pi of d of x. It's just reading the rows directly off the table. Because x1 refers to strategy c, x2 refers to strategy d. Okay? So we know now all the different variables we have. We have pi c of x, we have pi d of x, and we have the average pair of x. So now I can write down the dynamic here. Okay. So, therefore, if we just work out the algebra a little bit more for the average pair of function, you get it's x1. Actually, do I want to do that now? Uh, let me make sure. Yeah, I'll work with that. Okay. Yeah, so I will just work out the algebra a little bit more for this. So, pi of x is equal to x1 times pi c of x, but pi c of x is just equal to 3x1. So this is just going to be x1 times 3x1 plus x2 times 5x1 plus x2. So that's what the average payoff is. And now I can fill in the blanks for the x1 dot and x2 dot. So therefore, But I cannot emphasize enough, the whole thing depends on just reading off the values of the pair. So therefore, x1 prime is equal to 
3x1 minus x1 times 3x1 minus 5x1 x2 plus x2 squared times x1. Just filling in the blank. And similarly, x2 times is equal to um, 5x1 plus x2 minus 3x1 squared minus 5x1 x2 minus x2 squared times x2. So we have a dynamical system now. You see that. A nonlinear system of equations for x1 and x2. That will describe completely how these states evolve. But what am I missing here? What am I forgetting to write? Very good. Subject to So how many equations then do I really have here? Think about it. I can use the constraint to eliminate one of the equations. So how many differential equations do I really have here? One. That's why the constraint is extremely important in replicated dynamics, because it reduces the dimension of your system by one. So let's apply the constraint. You don't have to use it, but it's easier if you do. It's always easier to work with less equations. Well, that's the whole bit. So, so far all I've done is just fill in algebra. I've not done anything. Hopefully not complicated. Okay. <coughs> anyway. So if x1 plus x2 is equal to 1, I can eliminate one of the variables. It's up to you whether you want to work in x1 or x2. I'll choose x2. So this implies that x2 is equal to 1 minus x1. So then therefore, we can eliminate one of these equations. So x1 prime then, which I will choose to work with, and I will work it out for you. So minus 3x1 squared, minus 5x1 times x2, but now x2 is 1 minus x1. 1 minus x1, minus 1 minus x1 squared times x1. And you can, now you see we have one equation and in terms of completely x1. And if you continue on this madness of simplification, what you will get is 3x1 minus 3x1 squared minus 5x1 plus 5x1 squared minus 1 minus 2x1 minus x1 squared times x1. And all of these terms cancel, like majority. So this actually ends up being something very nice x1 squared minus 1. All that works and we get something simple. So what happens now? So it's still a dynamical system in terms of we still have a differential equation. So we can still have Okay. So therefore, x1 prime equal to x1 times 1 minus x1 squared, I'm um, sorry, x1 squared minus 1, completely describes the dynamics of this one equation. But as I said, I, I don't want to solve it, even though I possibly can in this situation, because it's just first order. It's not linear, but I want to use the tools that I've been talking about, even in this one dimensional case. So how can I do it? So this is still in the form of x prime is equal to f of x, obviously. So the first step, remember I said, is to find the equilibrium. So that's it. Equilibrium. Which will occur for f of x is equal to 2. 
In other words, when x1 and x1 squared minus 1. So what are the equilibrium points in this? is choosing strategy C, and one where everybody is choosing strategy B, right? Because X1 represents the population that chooses C, X2 represents the population that chooses B. So either everybody is choosing C or everybody is choosing B in the equilibrium point. There's no in-between. That's the first thing we learn from doing this. So what else can we do? two possible states of this population. One where every individual is choosing to cooperate or where everybody is choosing to defect. Oh, okay. So either it's zero or one. There's no half and half, if you know this. There's no two thirds and one third. It's explicitly zero and one in this case. Right. So the idea now, if you remember from my list last class, after you find the equilibrium points, what is the next step? What did I what did I say? Yeah, what is what is Okay, so and why do we want to compute the Jacobian? To determine which of these is stable, unstable, source and sink and so forth, right? Okay. In this case though, the Jacobian will just be the derivative of the right side because it's not a system, it's just one equation. So you can still compute a Jacobian of one equation, but it's just the ordinary derivative. Okay. So let's do that. So our 1D Jacobian, for lack of a better word, is just the derivative of the right side of the <coughs> The Jacobian in general is a derivative matrix of f, as you know, but in 1D it's just the ordinary derivative of the function. Okay. So, if f of x is equal to x1 times x1 squared minus 1, what is f prime of x? Yes. 3x1 squared minus 1. And just like before now, we evaluate now the equilibrium points at the Jacobian and see what sign we get. So at our first equilibrium point, x1 is equal to 0, we see that f prime of 0 is equal to 3 times 0 minus 1, which is negative. Less than. Furthermore, we see that f prime of 1 is equal to 3, 1 squared minus 1, which is 2, which is greater than 1. So, we don't have eigenvalues, but we have signs of the function in the 1D case. So, the sign of the Jacobian corresponding to x1 is equal to 0 is negative. That means that this is a sink. And this is a In other words, what this means So, 
x1 is equal to 0 is a sinks of the system where x1 is equal to 1 is a sink. Because the derivative matrix is negative in one case, it's positive. Just like having negative eigenvalues, it's positive eigenvalues. And what that means is that, so, if x1 is equal to 0 is a sink, and x1 represents the population of people that use strategy C. So what does this mean then for the prediction? How many people are using C? So then who is everybody using? X1 equals to 0 is a sink. Now, if X1 is equal to 1 was a sink, then everybody would be using C. But it's the way we chose our variable. So does everybody understand that? Yes? means is that every single individual, irrespective of his choices, will always choose to betray his country. Will always be there. <laughs> so x1 is equal to 0 means everyone will choose not C, but Always defect, you will always betray your friends. I asked actually when I was writing this up yesterday, this example, I asked my family. Uh, so I have a younger brother, younger sister, and my parents. And both of my brother and sister both chose the defect option, as what you would expect, because nobody wants to spend any time in jail. Um, my mother actually chose the opposite one, which is very interesting. She gave me a lecture on how important. A loyalty is important. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good, I don't know. Okay. So. x2 is equal to 1. That always must be true. So if x1 is equal to 0 is the final state of the system is the sink, then x2 is equal to 1 is also a sink of the system. In another way. You can. And in fact, as I will show you in the next example, which is an upgrade of this example, because this is always less than to 0, irrespective of what x1 is, um, it's a global solution. Yes. So in other words, when I talk about stability, sinks are always stable, sources are always unstable. Because everything approaches them, so we call them stable. And sources are repelled by everything, so we call them unstable. And saddles, by definition, are unstable because you have, don't have a clear attraction or repelling. Is this clear? More or less? So I want a full now uh, geometric topology analysis of this solution by Monday. Now I'm Monday. But I see, I told you, because now you see, I didn't have to stop the example when we reached the equation. I knew exactly what to do, because I, we have now a framework of how to analyze. OK. Any questions about this? So I don't think I'll try to finish the next example. I will introduce it. So maybe just some more ideas about this, maybe just to elaborate on it. Um, and I can post actually Nash's uh, PhD dissertation on the 
forms to you. Because a lot of this stuff came from these types of ideas. I think it was funny something to just say. But I mean, it's the foundation of the end. Um, okay. So in fact, x1 is equal to 0. We say, and I'll prove this to you um, next class on but corresponds to what is called a Nash equilibrium. And in words, that means that individuals um, have to be able to evaluate the consequences of their actions. switch or swap maybe to a better but not necessarily the best for the current strategy. So, in other words, you say that a population is stable. would get a better result by adapting to a different strategy. So, um, we didn't, 
to set the equation equal to zero or to find the equilibrium. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with the jail term. That's in general how we find the equilibrium. Uh -huh. Always by saying the right answer. So what's the Um, it's particular, but now see, the idea is that you have control over what the payoff will be. And that payoff may be. I designed the question, but I put on the finger. So in general, prisoners don't have control over how many different jails you have, right? So you, you, those are all super given to you. You choose based on what it is. But it's kind of a shady way of it. There's a more general way of it. Is that, 